the inequality produced by liberty. This, for the socialist in Latin America, is the soft underbelly of pro-market rationale and the best place to attack. I would argue that it is the intellectual stream that prevails in Latin America, and it's the reason the region cannot hope to meet its potential anytime soon. I write on a variety of topics uh, for the editorial page, but I have a special interest in Latin America, which is, I think, vastly undercovered in the American press. So having an audience to talk to about um, my views on the region is really a welcome thing. Latin America on paper has as much promise and potential as its English-speaking hemispheric neighbors to the north, and yet, obviously, we know that it lags behind. And in my 16 years at the Wall Street Journal, I have spent way too much time trying to figure out why that is so. Um, but tonight I'm going to share with you some of what I've learned, and of course, hopefully with the humility that David talked about last night, and um, also recognizing that it's dangerous to oversimplify any of the complex problems that, um, are, uh, that, the, that challenge the region. The fashionable explanations for Latin American underdevelopment are things like corruption, lack of education, poor infrastructure, and of course, income inequality. Of course, I reject those. Uh, I think those are symptoms of a bigger problem. I think the region's economic woes are better explained by what I like to call the three Ps, populism, protectionism, and prohibition. Even those are a byproduct of something that I think is much more fundamental that's gone wrong in the region. And I ask you just to focus for a minute on two things. First, to borrow a cliche that everybody here is very aware of, ideas matter. And second, that without entrepreneurship, a society cannot achieve prosperity. That's just a fact. You need entrepreneurs in your economy. And if you dig deeply enough, you will find that ideas from academia and from intellectuals more broadly in the region have played the key role in undermining the entrepreneurial culture in Latin America over the last century. I think more than anything else, this is struck at the heart of property rights and prosperity for hundreds of millions of Latin Americans. Now, many of us are probably, in this room, are probably not fans of John Maynard Keynes, but it has to be accepted that on some issues, he understood the world very well. Listen to this quote, and probably a number of you are familiar with it. It's from the very last chapter of General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which was, of course, his signature work. This is what he wrote. The ideas of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Mad men in authority, we know some of those, who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. I am sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared to the gradual encroachment of ideas. I agree with Keynes on this, and I think the evidence overwhelmingly supports his view. Latin Americans, as most of you probably know, you probably have neighbors and friends from the region, have no problem being entrepreneurial. Immigrants to the US have a long history of starting their own businesses once they've landed in America, so how come they don't display these skills at home? I submit to you it is because the dominant ideas in the region over the last century have been hostile to entrepreneurship. Now, this jumped out at me. As I said, I've been writing about the region for 16 years, but it really uh, uh, made me focus uh, 
Uh, last summer, when I reviewed a new book by the Mexican historian Enrique Krause called Redeemers and subtitled Ideas and Power in Latin America. The book profiles 12 individuals who Krause believes represent the major political ideas in the region from the middle of the 19th century through the 20th century. He starts with Jose Marti and ends with Hugo Chavez. He includes profiles on um, Eva Perón, Che Guevara, Octavio Paz, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Bishop Samuel Ruiz, and Subcomandante Marcos. Actually, of the 12 people he profiles, only one of them is a liberal. That's Mario Vargas Llosa. And when I was reading the book, I kept wondering, where during all this time were the, the entrepreneurs, the merchants, the architects, the builders, the creators, the innovators of Latin America? Every society has them. Why didn't they impose their own ideas on the region? And the answer, I believe, is just as Keynes wrote, that the intellectuals were the ones running things, and their ideas of the time were overwhelmingly hostile toward entrepreneurship, profits, and private ownership. Now, the power of ideas was well understood among intellectuals on the left throughout the 20th century. And they set about to get control of academia. In many ways, they succeeded as evidenced by what is taught, or at least what prevails, in institutions of higher learning in the region. And those of you who know or knew Muso Ayao, who was one of the founders of Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala, know very well that Muso's motivation for starting the university was he was very frustrated with the, 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 um, the lack of development and progress in Guatemala. And he recognized that if somehow uh, uh, the, the people who believed in freedom and uh, uh, private property and, pro uh, and ownership and profits did not get some kind of an influence in academic circles, they were never going to change the country. I think it's reasonable to argue that the ideas of the left um, gained more credence in, in Latin America than they did in the U.S. because the left was more successful in getting control of education. Venezuelan-born journalist Carlos Ball, who now lives in the United States, has written that after 40 years, he wrote about this when Ch around the time that Chavez was first elected, after 40 years of far-left controls of schools, universities, and the arts in Venezuela, the general public had, quote, fallen under a well-organized system of leftist indoctrination. Now, those sound like cliches, but if you go to Venezuela, you, it really is impossible to deny. I mean, that's basically how the society has been educated, trained, and, um, and how, how it thinks. And it wasn't only Venezuela. This was true throughout the region. As Enrique Krause shows in Redeemers, forces opposed to classical liberalism, working in the name of Latin nationalism, and much of that nationalism, I should add, Krause believes, came from kind of a backlash against the Spanish-American War and uh, a kind of uh, a feeling that the U.S. was imposing itself on the region. So there was this Latin nationalism, and that unleashed among intellectuals very early in the 20th century anti-Americanism that was attached to uh, sort of anti-markets point of view. This intellectual tendency in favor of nationalism and nationalism's economic counterpart socialism, were given a big boost during the Great Depression when the Smoot-Hawley uh, tariffs hit the region. Latin American policymakers re retaliated by closing Latin American markets. And for those who had resisted until then, American protectionism made it more and more difficult for them to defend, defend their positions. Of course, today the ideas of Che Guevara and Eva Perón, which are, as Hayek told us, uh, rival social uh, factions, are not popular. And by this I mean, you know, communism and fascism. But there are many people who still argue in favor of collectivism. And those people seldom attack private enterprise head on. I think they know that that's suicidal because they know that the market has created so much prosperity. But instead, they recognize that the market has created prosperity, and they ask us not to look 
at the wealth of nations, but instead what they call the morality, or perhaps more accurately, the immorality of the inequality produced by liberty. This, for the socialist in Latin America, is the soft underbelly of pro-market rationale and the best place to attack. I would argue that it is the intellectual stream that prevails in Latin America, and it's the reason the region cannot hope to meet its potential anytime soon. This idea that somehow we all have to be made equal is the prevailing sentiment across all populations because of the way people are educated. Now, there are plenty of reasons that it can't work, reasons that involve the relationship between risk-taking, incentives, profits, and rising living standards. And, of course, there's also a strong moral argument against empowering the state to erase inequality. But the trouble is that Latin American intellectuals brought this idea of equality as the highest goal from their ivory towers to daily life through the region's constitutions. And this, I think, is really the, the principal problem for a lot of the, the countries in the region. Latin America is on this path to, to poverty, but it's finding it impossible to get off because of the constitutions, which are perpetually rewritten by the academic and the intellectual elite to make state-sponsored equality the law. And of course, who can object to the goal to make it law that the poor child is going to have as much as the wealthy entrepreneur? But here's the problem with the Constitution written with the objective of creating equality. Fundamentally, it cannot guarantee individual rights. And that means that, the, that you can't have prosperity because you can't have it both ways. Latin American constitutions are hundreds of pages long. They have objectives like guaranteeing national development, eradicating poverty and substandard living conditions, reducing social and regional inequalities, promoting well-being. Years ago, I reviewed the 1988 Brazilian Constitution and found that citizens have constitutional right to education, health, work, leisure, security, social security, protection of motherhood and childhood, and assistance to the destitute. The 1988 Constitution guaranteed rights to minimum salaries, year-end bonuses, overtime, and vacation pay. They are guaranteed free assistance for children and dependents from birth to six years of age in daycare centers and preschool facilities. The culture section of the Brazilian Constitution charges the government with protecting Brazil's cultural heritage by means of inventories, registers, vigilance, monument protection degrees, expropriation, and other forms of precaution and preservation. And there's even a section dedicated to sports where the Constitution specifies that the government shall encourage leisure as a form of social promotion. Now, if you think about all this enshrined in a Constitution, you can easily see that the government not only has the power, but it has the obligation to use coercion to reach its goals. And this is the fundamental problem, a lack of liberty which emanates from constitutional mandates that intrude on every aspect of human action. Now, I just want to say, I've been picking on the intellectuals, I want to say one thing about uh, the business community. All of these problems, I think, start with the intellectuals, but they would not have grown out of, out of control the way they have if not for the fact that the business community joined in very enthusiastic because they thought there were benefits for, for themselves. And it, again, let's take the case of Venezuela. The 1961 Venezuelan Constitution was, by most accounts, a fairly reasonable document. But that didn't mean that factions, as Madison might have called them, didn't have reason to try to pick it apart. And they did. For 40 years, the Constitution was under assault, particularly private property rights. Of course, the left wanted to undermine the rule of law and property rights, but the business community helped. And again, I'm going to quote Carlos Ball, who's written a lot about this. And in fact, he wrote in the journal that the circumstances that brought Hugo Chavez to power, the so-called democracy and its attendant business interests, did not defend against assaults on liberty 
and private property, and this brought about much injustice and poverty. So the, the, they sort of created the situation that when Chavez came to power, people felt very dissatisfied with the status quo. Here's what Mr. Ball wrote about the slow deterioration of property rights in the 1961 Constitution. It's really frightening. <laughs> Many in the business community did not rebel against growing state intrusion because they saw that it was easier to convince one cabinet minister than a market of consumers. I'll never forget watching Venezuelan businessmen cheering the nationalization of foreign oil companies, not realizing that the politicians would soon come after them with more controls, regulations, and taxes." Close quote. And as we know, the government of Hugo Chavez subsequently has done much worse. When the state gets the moral high ground in matters of personal decisions and property rights, there's no end to the steps that it will take to contain liberty in the name of equality. Once this happens, the standard of living will necessarily decline. I think that's what explains why the region is stuck in poverty. And unfortunately, I don't feel terribly optimistic about anything changing anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. What do you see as the role or the significance of Fernando de Soto and his book, The Other Path, and the other work that he has done? For, for sure, it was important. But I, I think, you know, you, you see what's happening in Peru, and I mentioned in the beginning that protectionism, populism, and prohibition are three of the, the biggest challenges to the region. And I think what Peru managed to do um, uh, in the years after that book came out and, and um, you know, they tried to change the country, they opened the economy. That's the most important thing that they did in Peru. That's the thing that's really changed the country. There's still a huge amount of corruption, um, terrible, uh, uh, you know, abuse of government power and so forth, but the country's more open and that's forced the state to, to contract a little bit. And under de Soto also in his book wrote that the reason Latin Americans are poor and their governments don't work is because of proportional representation. That's a system where voters cannot vote for individual congressmen. They vote for party lists, Venezuela being a, a good example. Every five years, you could only vote the voters for the people they'd put out five years before. Right. And the old men running the parties control the names on the lists. And it's, it's yeah. a very dysfunctional system. And American exceptionalism may owe a lot to our Constitution and our system of, of federalism it's, and divided powers. but. The proportional representation is not addressed often, and that's the dysfunctional democracies in the world, Putin, Russia, another one, all have this system. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, uh, the kind of the poster child of this is Argentina, where um, the, the Peronists just continue every election with, this, with, with power because of that proportional representation. Um, but, I, but I think that's, again, that's like a, a symptom of a broader problem, which, I mean, we know the problem is too much government, too, too much, uh, the government has too much power. How does it get that power? It gets it through the way the politicians make laws and oftentimes through the Constitution. So, um, you know, when um, uh, the governor was here earlier talking about what he had done, I mean, the amazing thing about Governor Fortunio is not so much that he said, okay, government's too big, but that he was able to actually put those reforms in place. And I think the big challenge for the region is everyone knows what creates wealth. There's no mystery about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's almost a scientific thing at this point. But the political, um, you know, getting the political power to force the change is what the real challenge is. And I don't think you get that power, that people become empowered like that unless they have the right ideas. You know, you see uh, people talking about young people being involved in politics. What good is it if young people are involved in politics and they're all a bunch of robots and sent out, fr you know, to vote for Obama? Or, I mean, it's, it's, it's useless. So somehow it's the ideas. Young people have to be exposed to the, those ideas if you're ever going to see change. I want to ask you about a phenomenon uh, that occurred in the early 1990s in Latin America. There was something after the collapse of the Soviet Union, something called the Washington Consensus, which seemed to be 
some acceptance of privatization, of opening markets, and this sort of thing. Uh, was that really a flash in the pan? I think I could diagnose the problem by just looking at the name of it. I mean, really, is Washington going to give us the answers we need? Um, <laughs> I think the principal problem with the Washington Census, I remember also that people were very excited about it. And the governor was talking earlier about how crisis sometimes causes people to pay attention. And of course, the Latin American debt crisis in the 80s, they had the lost decade. And so they were looking for ideas and they were trying to come out of the problem. Um, so one of the, 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 the principal things was you know, to, to stop uh, pegging currencies while you're printing, printing money. I mean, I don't mind a, a fixed, uh, fixing your um, exchange rate to gold or something like that, but you can't be in the back room making more of it all the time, and that's what they were doing. My principal problem with the Latin American consensus was that there's nothing in that plan that talks about competition. Nothing. It's, it's you know, for example, they'd always burned me that they told these countries to take, for example, their telecom companies that were state-owned monopolies, and you'd walk down the street in Buenos Aires and you'd see all the, the wires going across Florida because they were just in complete disrepair. So they said, okay, here's, here's the idea. You're going to sell the telephone company to a private monopoly. Well, personally, I'd rather a public monopoly because they're easier to cheat. But um, uh, so, they, so when you would present that to them, they would say, oh, no, no, because you know, if you sell it as a private monopoly, you're going to get a lot of money for it. And so the government's going to get money. And what's the government going to do? It's going to pay down all the debt. And it's going to build schools. And you know, we're going to be prosperous, so we need that money. So they went around, and they, in almost every country, they, they turned the public monopoly into a private monopoly. In Argentina, one of the main problems, or, or a main problem with the convertibility law by the time it went bust in 2000 was, the prices for telecom were too high because they were, they basically divided the country and they divided Buenos Aires into two and they gave two monopolies in each part. And of course, we all know about my friend Carlos Slim in Mexico, which, uh, who also did the same thing. And so, you know, he made this huge amount of money off the backs of poor Mexicans. Um, there was nothing about competition in, in those, um, and what you ended up with was a bunch of monopolies in key sectors in the economy. Those countries could not be competitive. I think that the United States is actually, more than learning from Latin America, I think we're heading that direction. Yeah, I think and, you're right, um, yeah. And so what are some ways that you think we could learn from the myth of this like nirvana of equality? The late Bill Niskanen had a great um, piece in one of his books and in fact, when he died, I don't know if any of you know Bill, but he was at the Cato Institute for many years, wonderful economist. And uh, I remember hearing um, a speech he gave many, many years ago, but it's, it stuck with me. He, he said, um, you, okay, imagine you have two people. One guy is a really buff, 25-year-old, uh, good-looking guy who uh, tends bar in Santa Monica. And all day long, he plays volleyball, John. Uh, <laughs> and he has a really good tan and a great bod and, and he gets all the girls he wants. Um, but he only makes like, you know, say $25,000, $30,000 a year. The other guy is a um, paraplegic uh, who spends every day behind a computer. He's a computer programmer. I think as Bill described him, he was hygienically challenged or something like that. Didn't have many dates. But, um, you know, was earning better than six figures. And Niskanen used to say, how are you going to make these two people equal? And I just thought that was so powerful, you know, because, of course, the state can make them equal. They can move the money around, right? But you really can't make them equal. And, of course, you know, when we're children, we, we learn those things that, you know, that we're not equal, but we're special. There's no one like us. And, you know, that... That idea that you know people really aren't equal, they, they have all kinds of um, differences is, I don't know, should be, I, I would think something just fundamental to what we, we teach our children. But you know, if, if you go against that in a public school, you're, that's a tough challenge. I think we need to get rid of the public schools, how's that? <laughs>
part of the uh, problem with American foreign policy and trade policy is that we really do think that whatever we do is that causes all things that are good or bad in the world. How can American policy towards Latin America make things better, if not make things better, not make things worse? Well, ending the drug war is, you know, an obvious thing. And, and the problem there is just that we've empowered these huge organized crime networks that are overwhelming the, the, um, the power of the state in place, particularly in Central America. It's very bad right now. I have, for a long time, recommended three things. One, to get rid of the IMF. Um, and that's not going to happen. I think that the region has actually done what my friend David Malpass, uh, a, an analyst uh, on Wall Street who I'm, I've known for many years, he used to say, you know, you're never going to get rid of that bureaucracy. You're just not. It's, it's t behaving like a typical bureaucracy. But what, what countries have to do is learn to go without them. And I think Brazil has, has learned to do that, basically. And um, so uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, drug war, uh, and then of course trade. Um, I mean, I, my favorite um, recommendation there would just be unilateral disarmament, you know, open our markets, and I think that those countries would open, but, um, but at a minimum, uh, you know, don't sign a free trade agreement with Colombia and wait like six years or something like that to uh, ratify it. And lastly, I mean, I think the Fed is a big problem for the region because, um, you know, our money is not stable, and we're the reserve currency, so they're always trying to figure out how they can, I mean, it's very tough to have a trading relationship when you have this um, monster, you know, kind of controlling um, exchange rates, so at a minimum, the Fed could do a better job at stabilizing the value of the dollar, and my first choice would be, you know, to get rid of the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> So if you had a couple of New Yorker, New Yorker friends and they come to you uh, one night at a cocktail party and they say, you know, I'm just fed up. I hate the way this country's going. If Ron Paul doesn't win, I'm out of here. And for some reason, I want to go to Latin America's calling me. So I think there's uh, like 17 countries down there between South America and Central America. Where would you recommend the top three? <laughs> What's your top three list? Doesn't sound good when I'm listening to you, but there's got to be, you know, there's an idea in Honduras right now called the Charter Cities. Has anybody been following the Charter City idea? Yeah, so this is an idea sort of right up your alley. Maybe you want to join up. It's an idea that's promoted by an economist that, who's now at NYU by the name of Paul Romer. But the idea actually is sort of homegrown in, in Honduras. Um, they figured out that you know to make all the reforms and changes in the Constitution that they would need to make in order to create a liberal uh, um, economy would be too much because they're going to have special interests fighting them on everything. So they said, okay, we're going to take a big plot of government land that's on the sea and make like a kind of Hong Kong experiment. And um, so they'll be starting from scratch. There'll be someone to, uh, I guess there, there's going to be some kind of a sponsor. I don't know. They'll, they'll make a bunch of laws. And then anybody who can come in who wants to live by those laws, there'll be no minimum wage laws. Um, basically minimum amount of regulation and uh, they can choose their currency. They're going to be on the port so they're going to need some infrastructure development. But it's a fascinating idea and, and actually in the Hondurans have the idea that they would try to start at least a couple of these because you know one might be badly managed and if it fails then people are going to say oh that idea can't work. But if you have four or five and they have to compete like if you had competition in the, in the early 90s, then you have a better chance for success. I think it's a fascinating idea. And my friend um, Giancarlo Ibarguen, who's the rector at uh, Marroquin now, just loves it. I mean, he's, he's very enthusiastic about it, and they've held a couple of conferences on it. So uh, that's called Charter Cities. You might want to follow that. Mary, uh, reading over the years, I think you recognize all the problems that drugs have brought to Latin America but you've never been an advocate of the simple solution of ending prohibition. Uh, do you think you're going to come around to that at some point? What? How can you say that? I am an advocate of ending prohibition. Well, that was a simple answer. All right, on that note, thank you so much, Mary. You know, let me just, let me just say one thing about that. It kind of gets to the point, you know, when I was listening to David last night talk about tolerance and humility and 
You know, I've tried very hard to understand the fears. I, I think that there are a lot of special interests involved in the drug war, obviously. You know, there's a huge industry in Washington of helicopter manufacturers and people who chase these guys around the jungle um, forever. And um, so there, there are a lot of special interests. But I think that there's also a legitimate part of the population that's afraid of what this means. And what I've tried to do in my columns is Rather than say to them, tisk, 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 you know, don't you understand, you know, that prohibition is bad and, and uh, you know, can't you, why are you so uptight? <laughs> you know, what I've tried to do is get them to understand that, okay, let's, let's call this a bad thing, all right? Let's say we don't want it, okay? How are we going to manage this vice that we have, this thing that we want to minimize in our society? What's the best way to do it? And so what I try to say in my column is, think about the costs of the current, of the status quo. Think about what that is. Because I think a lot of people who, you know, I think in general if you have referendums and so forth, so far, most people would, would be against, for example, legalizing cocaine. But most people don't live with the consequences of what our war on drugs in Colombia has done. So what I've tried to do in my column is have a conversation with people so that they start to appreciate that this is not a, a cost-free policy that is just good for them and, there's no, and, and, and doesn't hurt anybody else. It's hurting someone else. And if they would see it in that larger light, I think that they would start to understand that we need a policy change. That's why I don't write columns that say we have to end prohibition but rather say, look, this isn't working. Can we at least agree that this is not working? That drugs are readily available and that the under consequences are very high for innocent people who have nothing to do with the drug war? Let's try to agree on that. And then I think you know, we can take further steps. And that's, that's why you don't read me wagging my finger. <laughs> All, right. All right, with that, we're gonna wrap up. Thank you so much, Mary.